Good morning, River Point. Welcome. Uh, for those of you I have not met, my name is Jim Jacobus. Uh, Christy, my wife, and I are members here, and uh, we're very heavily involved in marriage ministry and a couple of other ministries, and I will tell you this, uh, in order to make sure we do not lose our testimony in the area of ministry, we will not be participating in the wife-carrying competition. <laughs> the first time we saw the video, Christy just leaned over me a couple weeks ago and goes, no way. I said, praise God. <laughs> It is uh, good to be with you. Patrick is at his 30th high school reunion this weekend, and uh, how many have you been to a high school reunion before? All right, you know that they can be either one of two things, awkward or a lot of fun. Let's pray that uh, Patrick is having a lot of fun. Uh, I love this time. I love the opportunity to be here. I will tell you this, I had a major dilemma this week. After last week, and Patrick wore shorts and a t-shirt, and God bless him for doing that. I thought that was a great model of what it meant to be authentic in church. I just thought that was awesome. I love him for that. But I spent most of the week asking Christy, what do you think I ought to wear? <laughs> so in order to bring the level of decorum on this stage back to somewhere in the middle, I decided to wear a coat and tie today. What do you think? Is this all right? <laughs> I will tell you this. At the end of the first service, I was going, I am an idiot. <laughs> it is hot up here. I'll be sweating before we get through. You guys pray for me, okay? Uh, let me start us off in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this glorious morning. Thank you for this uh, music. Uh, your name, yes, your name. Father, we praise you. We thank you for that. I just looked it up to you. Father, thank you for this series we've been in. All the amazing things that happened in Acts, Lord. Thank you for that amazing church and amazing men and men, women that we could look at to get an idea of what you indeed have in mind for us today as well. So we lift this time up to you, Lord. Speak to us. Uh, Lord, you have an amazing purpose for each one of us. Speak to us today. Touch our hearts and help us understand what you called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, I had a great privilege to speak just down the road here at Houston Baptist University. Uh, I was really excited about that opportunity <laughs> at the time. I think I was traveling 250 days a year uh, to be able to get up in uh, my own bed and dress in my own home and drive just 15 minutes away to speak was a real thrill. Uh, but I was really excited because Houston Baptist University is an amazing place. Uh, with amazing people, and I was going to be speaking to the students and the faculty and staff and everybody there that day. Uh, so I was really excited. I got over there early, which is my habit, and uh, walked into the gymnasium we were going to be speaking in, and Dr. Hodo, who was the president of HBU at the time, an uh, incredible man, uh, if you've ever met him, you know what I'm talking about, was there working on a little bit of a PowerPoint that he was going to do prior to my speaking. And I uh, walked in, and Dr. Hodo looked up, and I went, good morning, Dr. Hodo. And he looked at me and goes, uh, why are you here? Uh, now, I'd never met him before, and so I said, uh, Dr. Hoda, my name is Jim Jacobus. I'm going to be speaking this morning and everything. He goes, Jim, I know who you are. I've seen your picture and everything. Why are you here? Folks, that is a speaker's worst nightmare, <laughs> that you would be in the wrong place at the wrong time for a speaking engagement, which means that it's some other time you hadn't planned on or it's already taken place. It was, it was kind of scared me to death. I said, Dr. Hoda, I thought I, I, thought I was speaking this morning, um, and he goes, oh, you are, Jim. Let me, let me put the question to you another way. He looked at me and he goes, why are you in my gym sucking up air? <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, I didn't know there was going to be a test. <laughs> and, and I was, real, I mean, I, I know that my face just looked like nervous and scared to death. And, and he, he kind of let me twist in the wind for a minute, which I think is sick. All right. <laughs> I prayed for him after that. But I, he, and then he said, he said, I apologize. He said, that's a bad habit I have. He said, let me, let me make it really clear. He said, what are you and I going to do this morning? to make a difference in the lives of the people that are going to walk in that door after a while. And folks, I thought, what a great question it is. Why are we here? What are we here for? I, I know in all the years I've had the privilege of speaking and traveling around the world, I know that most of us sit in an audience just like this. Sometimes we go, why am I here? What am I here for? Do I make a difference? I mean, even in a room like this, we've got a couple hundred you know, people in here, a thousand people in here. It's easy to kind of feel like we're lost, that we don't have anything uh, in our life that really matters and everything. And one of the biggest questions you and I want to do, do I matter? In the history of all the people that have crossed this planet and that will cross it in the future, you and I, do I make a difference? And the answer is absolutely. I just love Dr. Hodo's question. I, I, I think I continue to pursue that. Why am I here? What am I here for? Uh, I will tell you this. It's my belief system that each one of us is here that God has an amazing purpose for our life. No matter where we're at in life, you know, young people, uh, middle-aged, uh, and when I mean young people, I mean like my age, 
Um, can I get an amen from at least one other person out there that's about 60 years old, okay? Um, you know, God has some, something in mind for us that we haven't even dreamed of yet. And so we have to do a lot of things to kind of figure out what that purpose is. And today, uh, we're going to look at uh, Acts uh, chapter 5. And we're going to see the amazing purpose that they had in that chapter. Uh, as I thought about the whole idea of purpose, now I've been really blessed and uh, spent a lot of time in my career uh, training salespeople, training sales managers. And as we think about the idea of purpose, I can tell you that uh, sales managers always want to know this. What motivates my people? How do I motivate my people? Um, you know, a lot of times you may be thinking about how do I motivate my child? How do I motivate uh, my family? How do I motivate the other people? Well, I can tell you there are three primary motivators in this world, all right? You can check and see which one you use the most. Uh, I would encourage you to try to use all three because they're all valuable. Uh, the first motivator is pain. <laughs> now, how many of you used uh, pain as a motivator before? Let me see your hands. Be honest with me. All right, how many have children? All right, we've all used pain as a motivator if we have kids, right? The fear of pain, the fear of uh, that, that. We've all used that as a motivator. And uh, it's a very effective motivator from time to time. Uh, the threat of pain or the actual, you know, physical pain can be uh, quite motivating. And, uh, but I will tell you this, that sooner or later, pain runs out of gas. Sooner or later, if we just continue to use nothing but pain to motivate people, uh, they kind of become like that dog that's been beaten all the time that's sorted in the corner and somebody whacks it and the dog looks at it like, is that all you got? So pain can be very effective, but it runs out of gas. Now, the second motivator, which is a lot more fun, is joy or pleasure. And uh, again, in my career as a sales manager and uh, speaking with people, it is try to bring joy to people, bring pleasure to people. And uh, that's a great motivator, too. It's a lot more fun than pain, but the real uh, reality is it runs out of gas as well. Sooner or later, uh, we don't have the power to bring enough joy to continue to motivate somebody, so it runs out of gas. Uh, I've been really fortunate to meet a lot of people in my life, though, that uh, consistently use the third motivator, and their level of performance stayed at the highest level possible, and that was a sense of purpose. Or is that a sense of purpose in their life? I see companies that have a, a central sense of purpose, and the company's successful. I see individuals, I see families where they have a, a, an amazing purpose uh, for their family, and uh, God's blessing them and watching that happen. And with the Olympics going on, have you been watching the Olympics right now, by the way? All right, I, I just love the Olympics. I, I love watching all the TV, and uh, I love all the backstories of the Olympians. I don't know, anybody watched the uh, men's gymnastics last night? Uh, there was a guy from Ireland, I guess it was, I can't remember. Uh, this is, he was the only person from his country to ever uh, to be in the Olympics in gymnastics or something like that, if I got it wrong, my apologies. Uh, but this guy was like a real, uh, you know, uh, kind of just never happened before. And he participated, and he was doing all that tumbling stuff, which I don't know how they do that. I'd break something like the first time I tried to do a flip. If I even tried to do one, I wouldn't be able to do it. And he was doing all this stuff, and he kind of fell right at the end and everything. And they said, oh, no, he's not going to make it into the finals. Uh, but when the program was over, he had this big, gigantic smile on his face. And, and the commentator said, folks, that's a picture right there of a guy who uh, has done something he's never done before, and he's just glad to be here. And so that sense of purpose is really cool. And uh, Olympics and everything, I was thinking about who could I talk about, and uh, the answer came just like that. I, I am really blessed in my life to know a guy. Uh, his name's Ruben. Uh, I met him a number of years ago. He wanted to be a professional speaker. He came to me and said, would you mentor me? And I said, uh, well, kind of what's your deal? And he goes, well, I'm Olympian. And I'm like, <laughs> and I looked at him, and I was like, no way. You know, it's just, he, didn't, he didn't have the look of an Olympian. I said, well, what's your story? He said, well, 1984, I was watching Scott Hamilton uh, participate in the Olympics, the skater guy. And he said, I looked at that little dude and said, if he can do it, I can do it. And he went, Ruben went and researched all of the Olympic sports. All right, and he'll tell you, he's not an athlete, never been a very good athlete. He researched all of the Olympic sports to find one he thought he could participate in. Can you imagine that? I mean, he never had, he said, I just started researching all the Olympic sports. He settled on the luge. You guys know what that is? That's the one-man sled in the Winter Olympics that goes down that deal like at 80 miles an hour, just flying down there. One person, he said, I had to do the luge because nobody would have invited me to be on a team. <laughs> I mean, that's what, how bad of an athlete this guy was. And he says, I, I, I chose the luge because it was a one-man deal, and I thought I could do it. And uh, so three weeks after the 1984 Olympics were over with, he was in Lake Placid going through a beginner's luge class. 
He'll tell the story that there were 15 people in that class, and when it was over with, he was the only one left. He'd tell you that in his first three years of training, he crashed four out of five times. Four out of five times he crashed. And they trained on a concrete luge course. So when they crashed, I mean, it's probably not any better or worse than ice is, but 80 mile an hour crash on concrete, three years. I'm really blessed to tell you that uh, Reuben is a four-time Olympian. Participated in the Olympics in three different <laughs> decades. Yeah. And you can imagine with that kind of sense of purpose, what kind of professional speaker he turned out to be. He's an amazing guy. I'm blessed to know him. Uh, he's done so well that he and his family moved, left Houston a couple of years ago. They live in Colorado Springs on a 40-acre lake, and God's blessing them, and he's a godly man with a godly family. Now, what's really kind of bizarre about this whole thing, or at least it is to me, if, if it's not to you, just act like it is, okay? Um, I made up my mind last week I was going to share Reuben's story with you guys because I just think he's awesome. Tuesday, I'm up in Dallas. I'm doing some work, and I was busy all day long, and Tuesday afternoon, I opened up my cell phone to kind of see who was trying to catch up with me. I've not seen Reuben in two years, and there was a phone call, Reuben Gonzalez. I was like, wow. <laughs> I actually showed it to a buddy who was with me, and he was going, man, you got to call him right now. And I go, no, nah, I'm letting this God moment sink in for a little bit before I call him because he may have wanted something that's not. I talked to him this week, and he's doing great. And, and I'm just so blessed to know that. And, and, and I will tell you this, God not only had an amazing purpose in Reuben's life, all right, from the Olympic standpoint, but he's using Reuben uh, to speak to people in a godly, amazing way all around the world. And I will tell you this, wherever you're at right now, God's got the same kind of amazing purpose for you. Uh, when Adam said a while ago, talk about coming in here with a bunch of junk, man, we've all got a bunch of junk. And I will tell you this, in the midst of the junk, God has amazing purpose. So we're going to look at the uh, fifth chapter of Acts today, and I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. Patrick said last week, this is a, a real historical book, and so kind of going through all the uh, stuff doesn't really uh, help us a lot. So I'm just going to kind of hit the highlight points. Uh, first thing is we look at chapter 5 and we see a church on fire. I mean, it is growing every day. It's getting bigger. Things are going awesome. Uh, everybody, you know, you heard the story. They were bringing their stuff and selling it and giving it to the church. <laughs> I'm glad Patrick was preaching on that instead of me. Uh, and then Ananias and Sapphira die because they lie about it. And I'm really, really glad that Patrick was not gone last week instead of this week because I'm not sure what I would have done with Two people walking into church, giving a bunch of money, and God going, bam. I had a hard time with that. I thought Patrick did a great job. And so people are coming to know uh, Jesus right and left and understanding the gospel. And in the midst of this, the uh, religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, uh, all, all the, 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 the folks that are in charge of the religion at the time, they get jealous, and they get really angry. This is the same group that was jealous of Jesus and got angry with him and crucified him. It's the exact same group. And so uh, they grab uh, John and Peter, and they put them in jail, all right? They put them in jail, and then they're going to gather the whole Sanhedrin together the next day, and, uh, and they're going to have a conversation with them. It's not going to go well. And in the middle of the night, an angel busts them out of jail, all right? They're locked up and everything, and an angel busts them out of jail. Now, I just got to think that's really cool. You're there. You're in jail. You're being chained up. You know, guards are all around and whatever the angel did comes in and goes, let's go. You're out of here. And uh, the, the guards didn't even realize they were gone. And so the angel busts them out of jail and says, go back to the temple and start preaching again. So the next morning, these guys who have got to realize their life is in danger go right back to the temple and they start preaching again. And uh, so the Sanhedrin gathers together. They don't even realize these guys have gotten out. They get them all together, the Sanhedrin together, and they go, go get John and Peter and bring them here. We're going to talk to them. All right? And so the guy goes to get them. He comes back and goes, uh, they're gone. <laughs> and the guards don't even know where they went. Now, I don't know about you, but at that point in time, I think I'd have let them alone. That's just creepy enough that I would have gone, they got out of jail, nobody knows how. Nope. I'll tell you what, let those guys go. Let's don't mess with them. But they didn't. They sent for them, brought them back in, and uh, they're going to question them. And we pick this up in Acts 5, 27 and 28. It says, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. High priest says this. It says, we gave you strict orders not to preach in this name. Right? Not to preach in this name. What name are they preaching in? 
name of Jesus, amen. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. All right, now, I, I, first thing is, I, I just think this is amazing stuff to begin with, but here's what I, I really kind of grabbed a hold of this week as I was studying. It says, yet you have filled Jerusalem. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. This wasn't just a bunch of people gathered in a corner in a small, small group Bible study. This was something that God was doing where everybody in Jerusalem was hearing about it. And these guys are very popular. Um, and he goes on to say, you, you are trying to make us guilty of his blood. And they know they're guilty of his blood. They know that what they did was wrong. So they're really angry at him. <laughs> and it says in uh, Acts 5, 29 through 32, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. I just love that. And then, in the midst of all this, they share the gospel of Jesus Christ. They say, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging in him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. In the midst of all this, these guys with no fear, no trepidation, no concern, uh, say, we don't obey men, we obey God, and then they share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the religious leaders. Now, we have to realize, these men and women of, of the church of that day, they were not the learned folks. The learned folks were the Sanhedrin and the the religious leaders, they're the ones that had done all the studying and everything, and yet here are these men, these common people, uh, folks like you and I who, who stand in front of them and go, we don't obey you, we obey God, and then they share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I just think that's amazing, and we go on and ask uh, the rest of five, and uh, we hear a couple more things. Uh, they share the gospel, and it says that the religious leaders were furious and wanted to put them to death. They were going to do the same thing with these apostles that they'd done with Jesus Christ. They're going to put them to death. Uh, so they're really angry. They're really frustrated, really upset. And then this guy named Gamaliel steps in, and uh, he's also a religious leader. So uh, uh, he was really kind of a bright guy, and, uh, and I think he shows a lot of wisdom here. Uh, he decides to, he persuades them not to kill him. And uh, you can look at the kind of the commentaries, and they all suggest a couple things. One is, um, and he just was, you know, he just thought it was a bad idea. Uh, second thing is, um, they knew how popular the disciples had become. The word was, you know, the whole of Jerusalem knew what was going on, and they were concerned that if they killed him, there'd be a big uprising, and when that happened, the Romans would step in, and everybody would be in trouble. And so he kind of thought, maybe it's not a good idea, we don't want to cause a lot of trouble and everything. Uh, but I think his wisdom is really shown when, he, when Gamaliel says this to the Sanhedrin. He says something I think really important. If their purpose is of human origin, it will fail. If it is of God, you won't be able to stop it. I just love that. If it's of human purpose, it'll fail. If it's of God, we can't kill it. And it says also in some of the commentaries that Gamaliel might have said, we don't want to get in a fight with God. <laughs> That'd be a bad deal, wouldn't it? And so uh, I looked at that, and it reminded me, uh, back a few years ago, I had the privilege of going to Bulgaria and preaching, and I had a good time, and I was preaching one evening at the First Baptist Church of Sophia, and uh, it was a, kind of a small church and everything, uh, but what I would tell you is that as we got closer to the time for the praise and worship music and everything, the place was packed. I mean, people were sitting on window seals, everywhere you could sit, they were there, uh, and, and it wasn't because we were there, they did this every uh, night, almost. And uh, matter of fact, there was so crowded, there were people sitting all down front, and I had the privilege of preaching, and they were uh, using an interpreter, and uh, he was, uh, I'd speak, and he'd have to wait, and they'd say a few things, and I remember praying, I hope he's saying what I said, uh, or better, maybe he's saying something better than what I have, and uh, the people were all smiling and nodding, and I talked about, we were members at William Trace right down the road, and I talked about that uh, we were blessed to be from a church where this Sunday there may be 1,000, 1,200 people uh, that will be in worship. And uh, within a few minutes, uh, there was this really old, old woman sitting down front. I mean, cross-legged right down front. And I, she had tears running down her face. And I said to the interpreter, I said, would you ask her why she cries? And so he said a few words to her. She replied back with a big smile on her face. And he turns to me and he said, 
She weeps with joy that there's somewhere that a thousand people will be in worship at at one time. And I was like, wow. I said, tell her this for me. I weep too that I live in a country where we're free to worship and only a thousand people will be there this weekend. We left that church that evening and Teddy K, and we call him Teddy K because to pronounce his last name is impossible, so it was a whole lot easier to call him Teddy K. Teddy was taking uh, Michael Hurdle and I back to our hotel, and we're going through the streets of Sophia, and he almost slammed on the brakes and jerked the car over to the curb and everything, and I was sitting in the back, and I was like, well, you know, and he turned to me and he goes, I have a problem with you and what you preach tonight. And I go, all right, a lot of people do. What was it? <laughs> What did I do this time? He goes, you talked about the idea, and it's one of the things that I've preached. You guys, I preached it here last summer, that if, if it works, it's God's principle, whether the person knows it or not, it's God's principle uh, in the world. If it doesn't work, it's because it's against God's principle in the world, whether the person uses it or not. And he said, I don't understand how that could be true. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, my people will go home tonight, and they will be hungry, and they will uh, sleep in terrible places and things like that, and they're good people doing the right thing, while the people that lead my country are evil, and they do the wrong thing, and tonight they'll be sleeping in big houses and have great feasts and things like that. How could you say that? And I said, well, you know, my little pea brain comes at it this way. Those people of yours that were with us tonight, they will go home, and while their bellies may not be full, and their houses may not be wonderful or beautiful. They sleep under the grace of Jesus Christ that will raise them one day to heaven. And I said, whatever happens on this earth to them is, is not how we measure success. That will be ultimate success. And those people that have stolen and cheated and all of that while they live in the big house and they eat the food, we don't know whether they sleep well tonight. And we don't know whether that food sets well on their stomach. And if they've not come to know the grace of Jesus Christ, we know that they'll not be in heaven. And that would be truly failure. And so when we think about what's going on here in the church of Acts and all that's happening and everything, um, we've got to think about God's purpose in our life. How do we get plugged into that? So it goes on to say that Gamaliel steps in, he persuades them not to, and uh, everybody kind of agrees with him, okay, let's let them go. <laughs> but before they let them go, they beat them. All right, and it says in the commentaries that they probably got the uh, maximum number of lashes at the time, which was 39, and I was trying to figure out where they come up with the number 39, but evidently that was a number, and so they beat, beat them and everything, and they let them go, and it says in Acts 5 that they left there rejoicing that they were worthy of suffering for the gospel. <laughs> they just, they beat them, all right, they're flocking, and it says that they left there rejoicing that they were worthy of of being persecuted for the gospel. And I think that's awesome. You know, we, we don't have to worry about that kind of persecution here. We have to worry about maybe somebody that makes fun of us or says, do you really believe that stuff or whatever? That's the kind of persecution we deal with. And from there, what'd they do? They went right back to preaching the gifts as they continued to share the gospel in the temple courts and from house to house. They went right back to doing what they were doing before. And I just think that's amazing. I think that's, that is a byproduct of having an amazing purpose in their life. So the question is, what do we do with that? All right, we look at these things that are going on. What do you and I do with that? And I'm, I want to share like three or four things I think are important for us to do. Uh, the first per thing I would tell you is if, if God's making a difference in our life, and <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine sometimes uh, where we've been, where I've been in my life and where we are now, and God's making a difference, and uh, it's just... I know I'm not worthy of it, and I praise God for that. Uh, but if God's making a difference in our life, then we have to be burdened for people that don't know him. Like the, 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 uh, the apostles, when they shared the gospel with the Sanhedrin, I believe they did that not to defend what they were doing, but because they were concerned for the souls of those people that were judging them. They were concerned for the souls of the people they knew that had crucified Jesus Christ. So if God's doing something different in our life, we have to be, we have to be burdened for other people. And I, I was a little worried about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, would you do me a favor? We, we don't have to get flogged or anything before we leave here tonight, but if God's making a difference in your life, if this church is making a difference in your life, would you take a moment and just stand for me? Let me see. Would you stand and say, God's making a difference? Wow. <laughs> All right, you can sit. Praise God. Praise God. If that's true, we can't keep it to ourselves. Now, 
I don't know where you're at. I don't know what, what's going on with your life as your relationship with God is. Maybe you're here, and maybe the first time you've ever come, and I don't, they don't know, we don't normally wear suits up here, right? So I'll just give you that. That's not normal. Um, first time I came here, I wore slacks and a shirt, and the second week I wore shorts, and this is the uh, last time you'll ever see me with a coat and tie, which, by the way, just quick note, it is hot up here. <laughs> but anyway, so... If God's making a difference, we've got to do something about that. And if you're just getting started, all right, and God's just now beginning to make a difference in your life, enjoy that phase. But, but there may be a great opportunity with somebody in your family to go, you know, I started going to this church, and I don't really understand it yet. I don't get it all, but you got to come try this thing. It's, it's different. God's reaching people through River Point that will never be reached down the street at, at Williams Trace or at any of the other churches here. And God's reaching people there too, by the way in the ways that uh, he, his wisdom creates that. Uh, but maybe, you know, I, a guy I met a while ago said, man, we started coming to this church. i not a churchgoer, but I, I can't not come on Sunday mornings. And so if that's where you're at, then just keep coming. Let God keep working. That's the Holy Spirit doing that. And, and maybe you bring somebody with you that, that doesn't really go to church, and, you know, they'll say, I don't like church. And you go, I didn't either. <laughs> I like this place. And so maybe, maybe you're on the, uh, you know, maybe you've been here for a while and, and God's really beginning to do some things in your life and beginning to change and now it's time to plug in. It's time to go, I need to get involved. I need to do something here. Uh, maybe it's in the young adults or in the kids or whatever, you know. God's giving you some gifts and everything. Maybe you're kind of going, I, 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 want, I want to be used. And if that's the case, then I challenge you to step out and let God use you. Find a way to plug in and let God work through you. I talked about that last time, how powerful it is when God starts working through us, not just around us. And uh, there are a lot of people in this church that are into that category. I've seen so many of you grow right along with Christy and I. And, and uh, let's just keep growing because it's fun to get plugged into what God's doing. And then this church has lots of great leaders, uh, people that are solid men and women of God that go here. And uh, praise God for what you're doing. I pray that God would continue to expand your ministry and that you'd be able to reach even more people i pray that for you too but wherever we're at there's a chance for us to, to to say god's making a difference i can't just keep that to myself god's got a purpose beyond uh just living in this life that's uh, a godly purpose i think the second thing we have to do is we have to truly understand the gospel of jesus christ it's an amazing truth but reality is uh the 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 apostles when they were in that really tough situation shared the gospel and it's really simple. You and I are sinners. We're separated from God. All right? God loves us, cares about us, wants to have a relationship with us, but that sin keeps us separated from him. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to this earth uh, to walk and show us what it meant to, to live uh, a godly life. And then Jesus was hung on a cross and crucified, All right, paid the price for all of my sins and all of your sins. And he was laid in a tomb, rose three days later, hung out with the disciples for a while, and then was raised, as the apostle said, to the right hand of God and sits there. And he did that just so that if I would accept that grace, that gift from God, that I could have a relationship with him. We need to understand that. We need to be able to share that in some way, some shape, some form. And again, it's, you know, there's a place in time for that. Um, and, and there's all kinds of places in time. My place in time is not on a corner thumping a Bible, yelling and screaming downtown Houston, Texas, but praise God for men and women that do that. All right, but God's got a place for us to do that. He's got a way. He's got a time for us, and we've got to be willing to understand the gospel so we can share that. Next thing is, we need to pray that God would use us. We need to literally go, Lord, use me. I'm ready, okay? However you want to use me, use me. Uh, I'm there, and, and here's a little tip, okay? Uh, uh, years of frustration. We have to pray that and then wait for the right time. All right, that right time may be 30 seconds later, and that right time may be a while later. Um, about 15 years ago or so, uh, in my speaking business, we were doing really well, and I felt like God was calling me to use that gift to preach. Um, and I, I was really certain of that. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to start using this gift you gave me. I want to preach. And I mean, I was on fire. I'm, you know, ready to go. Just sign me up. Let me go. And, um, a good buddy of mine that I got to know at the time, uh, knew I was really on fire, but nothing was happening, you know? And uh, he sent me a book. It's titled Paul, a Man of Grit and Grace, written by Chuck Swindoll. It's a great book. And I love Paul. Uh, I just love the redemptive value of Jesus Christ in his life. And so I'm reading the book and everything, and I get to like the 11th chapter or something like that, and Tim had highlighted that chapter, and he said, I thought you needed this. 
And I read the chapter, and it's about Paul's life. He had had this conversion experience. He became on fire for the Lord, and uh, he's telling everybody, and the story is, is that if he continued on, they would have killed him. Paul would have been killed. So he was exiled. And it says he was probably exiled back home for 17 years. 17 years, this man on fire was, was exiled back home. And when I got to that point, Tim had written me a note. He says, just wait, you're not ready. Huh. I called him on the phone. I said, what a jerk. <laughs> I, I, we had this loving relationship where I could do that. And I said, what a jerk. I said, I said I'm, I, are you serious? He goes, trust me, you're not ready. If you do it now, you're going to mess up. Right? You'll ruin your ministry, and you'll also you'll ruin the gospel. Don't Just wait. You're not ready. And I'm going to tell you what, that, that is not what I wanted to hear at the time. I can assure you it's not what I wanted to hear. And folks, it took a long time. I prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, I'm ready. Let me do this. Give me an opportunity. I mean, I'm speaking all over the world to huge audiences and stuff like that who thought what we did was amazing, and I'm going, surely I can do this. And I look back now, no, I was not ready. I even got angry with God. I, I can tell you this, I've driven down the road in my own car with nobody in it, and I've yelled and screamed and cried and said, Lord, take it away. If you don't want me to do this, get this idea out of my head. This is driving me nuts. And it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and I prayed to preach at River Point Church, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and I finally just relaxed and said, okay. And then last summer, Christy and I were driving down to Rockport, phone rang, and Jason Pisatola was on the phone. I said, what's up, man? He goes, Mr. Jacobus. Now I tell him, don't call me that. I'm going to punch you in the nose if you call me Mr. Jacobus one more time. It makes me feel old. And he goes, um, Patrick wants to know if you'll preach this summer. <laughs> I said, absolutely. He goes, you don't even know what it is. I said, I don't care. <laughs> I've been waiting a long time for that call. I said, absolutely, I'll do that. And I uh, hung up the phone, and uh, as Christy is my witness, I think I cried for the next 15 minutes. And it was so much better when it came than I think it might have been. <laughs> it was so much better when it came than it might have been a long time ago. Christy was worried about me. She was, what are you crying about? Somebody dead? What happened? <laughs> I go, no. Nah. And I told her, and it was just like, this is this great trip of joy. This is my fourth time to do this now. I so love this church. I so love you guys and what goes on here. It is such a privilege to do this. That the joy of my heart is this time right here. And I enjoy the rest of my life too. If you know me, you know I'm a full tilt guy. But this is the joyous joy of my heart right here. And I share that with you to say two things. One is got the exact, God's got the exact same joy in mind for you as we figure out what his amazing purpose is in our life. It's got the exact same thing. And we just need to simply be, away, be, be available and say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. What do you want me to do? And sometimes we've got to wait. If you're in that waiting period, come see me. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> But when the time is right, it'll be amazing. So we've got to be willing to do that. And the last thing I think we've got to do is, is that when the time comes and the door opens, we've got to step through it. These apostles had no fear for their life, no fear for anything. I don't know if they just thought God was going to protect them. They weren't going to die or they didn't care. I love Paul again when he says, uh, to die is to gain and to stay here is to, you know, cry. I mean, he could care less. You take me and kill me. I don't care. I'll go get to be with him and leave me here. I can do some more ministry. I mean, that is the ultimate attitude, is it not? And so when the time comes and the door opens, we've got to be willing to step through, and we can't worry about what the repercussions are. I can assure you that when we do, God's going to bless us in an amazing way. So I think those are the five things we've got to do as we look at this church and we see them on fire and we see lives being changed. We've got to be willing to do that. Um, my favorite scripture in the whole world is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I beg of you in light of God's mercy, present yourself as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, that's your spiritual act of worship. That's my prayer for each one of us today. That we would present ourselves, we would go, I'm yours. I know you have an amazing purpose for my life. I want to find out what it is. I pray that each of us would do that. Let me close this in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for 
this amazing church in Acts and all that was going on there and all the people's lives that were being impacted in an amazing way. And Father, thank you for this church right here and all the things that are going on and all those that stood and said that you're changing their lives in amazing ways. We lift it up to you, Lord. We want to experience everything you had in mind for us. We want to experience your amazing purpose. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory for all that takes place. I lift that up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.